Woodrow Wilson gave the 14 points address not far from here. Um, there's, there's something ironic about anniversaries and centennials, right? By definition, they tell us that we are further away from the event than we've ever been before. <laughs> and yet they make us feel closer to the event. So I, I, I enjoy that, that uh, feeling and that irony. I want to begin by recalling the specific historical context which led to that speech 100 years ago. And the most important part of that is, as Jennifer mentioned, the Bolshevik Revolution. Now, it's true that Wilson worried about Lenin's promise to take Russia out of the war. Uh, but I think there's something more important here, in which, uh, which is that Wilson saw Lenin and his revolution as a symptom of a broader malaise affecting human affairs at that historical moment, a malaise that went beyond Russia, even beyond Europe, into the body politic of America itself. And I further want to argue to you that Wilson's perception of the threat that Lenin posed grew out of his analysis of the challenging facing the United States domestically in his time. Now, what do I mean by that? Wilson came a political age in what we now know as the Gilded Age, a profound, an age of profound historical transformation in US history. If we wanted to sum it up, we would include an age of rapid globalization, large-scale immigration bringing new diversity and new tension into US society, sweeping technological and economic changes, recurring financial panics and social dislocation, and finally, steep rise in inequality with attendant, uh, uh, attendant strains on the social fabric. In short, uh, his time was one not unlike our own. Now Wilson, looking at all that, serving that landscape, worried about the decline of democracy in America in the face of the growth of unaccountable power held in the hands of the few. And he was thinking in particular of the great financial and industrial barons of the era. Let's see if this works. He was worried about two dangers to stability at home. One, as I said, the decline of democracy in the face of growth of unaccountable power, which I depicted here on the right with J.P. Morgan. And he was worried equally about what he saw as the inevitable reaction to this concentration of wealth and power namely social unrest and indeed revolution. And this I depict on the left with a picture of a less famous but arguably no less important character, Leon Cholgos, who was, anybody know? The ass assassin of President McKinley, exactly. So what was Wilson's answer to this as a political leader, as a president? What he wanted to do as a progressive, in the sense of the early 20th century, was to push for a stronger government role in the economy in order to promote economic stability, to advance protections for labor, and to break up monopoly capital. In other words, what he was looking for is a third way between plutocracy and anarchy, a path of reform that would check unaccountable uh, power, and in that way stave off upheaval and revolution. So that's a domestic scheme. And Wilson was a domestic thinker. He was a scholar of US history, US constitutional history, and constitutional structure. He gave very little thought to international affairs or international relations until after he became president. And so he used the scheme that he had developed in his mind uh, for thinking about US domestic affairs to think about world affairs as well. Looking at the international arena during the Great War, he spied a similar dialectic at work. And I just put Wilson here, positioning himself in the center. And the dialectic he spied in the international arena was similar in structure to this. You had unaccountable power on the right, which for him was symbolized by the German Kaiser, but we can also put the Russian Tsar there before his um, abdication. And on the other side, you had, for, for him, the inevitable reaction to, under, under, to, to, to unaccountable power, which is revolution. That is to say, Lenin. And for Wilson, 
his task, America's task in the war, in the world, was precisely to find that middle way, that third way, that, 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 that path to reforming international order in such a way that would make it more accountable and therefore more stable and less revolutionary. <clears throat> now, when Lenin first came, Lenin and the Bolsheviks first came to power in November of 1917, Wilson knew very little about him, about his movement. We have to remember how marginal this group was before they came to power. But he knew enough to know that he didn't like their program, that their program was about anarchy, not about order. After all, what Wilson wanted is, to, is change in order to improve the liberal capitalist order. What Lenin wanted was to tear down that order. They both shared the sense that world politics had to be transformed, but the transformation each of them wanted was very different. Wilson sought to chart, as I said, a third way between reaction and revolution. For Lenin, and Lenin says this very, Lenin sees this analysis very clearly, he says it clearly. For Lenin, the choice was stark. You could either have reaction, which he defined as capitalism and imperialism, of course the two were in his mind int intimately connected, or you could have revolution. For Lenin, there was no third way. So this is the context. This is, I think, how we need to understand the broader scheme that's behind the 14 points. Yes, one of the things he sought to do was to keep the Bolsheviks in the war by highlighting the, shared, the goals he shared with them. But more importantly, he sought to blunt their, the appeal of their revolution by co-opting some of their program. Most notably, at least for my uh, few minutes here on the, on the uh, stage, he soon adopted the principle of self-determination as his own with widespread, if not wholly intended, consequences. So one way for us, I would argue, to think about the 14 points is as the first instance of what historian John Lewis Gaddis, the Cold War historian, called an American strategy of containment of communism. Now Gaddis, of course, was thinking and, and writing about post-World War II strategy of military diplomatic containment of the Soviet Union. But containment was bigger than that. Containment also sought to contain the spread of communism as an ideology, at least as much, if not more, than it aimed to contain Soviet state power. And we have to remember that the 14 points were coupled with US support for an allied military intervention in Russia that tried to roll back the revolution. But if the 14 points were, as I argue, the first salvo in a strategy of containment, it was not a passive containment that's, that sought to restore the, world, that, that restore the world before the revolution. It was a strategy that was founded on Wilson's view that long-term historical trends what we will call today modernization and globalization, required, required, required. It's not that he thought that this would be a good idea or would lead to some kind of ideal world, but that the situation, the crisis, the global crisis required a major transformation of international order and that the devastating shock of the war itself, about which Senator Warner reminded us so eloquently just a few minutes ago, the devastating shock of the war itself made that transformation both more urgent and also more possible, more likely, by shaking the foundations of the old order. Now the 14 points were the, were the first outline. They weren't the complete articulation. They were the first outline of Wilson's vision for that new order, what we now call a liberal internationalist order. They included free trade, freedom of the seas, open diplomacy. They also included, and this was a not very novel idea at the time, a permanent international organization, a League of Nations, that would facilitate international collaboration for peace and stability. But the one element of the 14 points that I want to focus on uh, for the remainder of my time is the principle of self-determination and how that fits into the broader scheme. Now, contrary to still common perception, the phrase itself, self-determination, was nowhere to be found in the January 1918 speech. Still, uh, it's understandable that it's been, re it's been remembered as part of that speech, 
uh, because in some sense, its spirit did permeate the address. For example, several points in the address called for, quote unquote, the autonomous development, autonomous development for the peoples of the Ottoman and Habsburg empires. He didn't quite define what autonomous development meant and that was part of the point. Now, Wilson was no expert on the history, demography, and politics of these regions, but even he knew that demands for self-determination were part of what helped ignite the war. It did begin, after all, with the assassination of an Austrian archduke in the name of the self-determination of the South Slav people. So in his mind, he wasn't introducing a new principle into international discourse. He was simply adopting one that was already um, out there as he called it, a necessary principle of action. But the point that I find most interesting of all, let's see if this is going to work. Yeah, they, I mentioned these. This is the point that I find most interesting of all. Uh, point five, this is not a, a pre the precise text of the entire point, just a summary. Uh, basically in point five, Wilson called for the adjustment of all colonial claims given quote, the interests of the populations concerned, that is to say the colonial populations, equal weight with those of colonial governments. This isn't, this isn't a full-throated endorsement of anti-imperialism, but for its time, for an American president, it was, it was quite a departure from American policy. Now, why do I find this so interesting? Well, part, first of all, it's that we know from the paper trail of the 14 points address that we find in the archive, that it was the one point of all of the 14, it was the one point that Wilson drafted entirely on his own. All the other points were based on various drafts that he had gotten from his advisors, from his experts in one way or another. This one originated entirely with him, which I think is, is fascinating. It was not drawn for the re from the recommendations handed to him by his advisor. And it's especially interesting because it injects what we might call the colonial question into the discussion of the post-war order. And this was a question that he didn't need to inject. Most of his close advisors and certainly his closest allies abroad, the British and the French, were uninterested in talking about the colonial question at the Paris Peace Conference. Would have preferred he leave it out entirely. And yet he didn't. And after all, it's point five that eventually leads to what we later, later becomes the League of Nations mandate system, a system that challenged, at least in principle, the sovereignty, the complete sovereignty of colonial powers. It made them, in theory, caretaker governments, accountable, and this is a key word here, accountable to a higher international authority. This goes back to what I said before about his sense of the need to increase accountability in international affairs. And what this tells me, and the fact that he added this point into his 14 points address, maybe he didn't want, maybe he thought 13 points would be unlucky, but I think it's, it's, it's gotta be more than that. It's gotta be more than that. Clemens would have had a nice quip with 13 points. Um, so why did he introduce the colonial question into his peace plan, even when there was no obvious pressure to do so? Again, it went to his view that governments accountable to their populations were the key to peace and stability, both at home and abroad. And to me, it suggests that despite some later interpretations, he believed, at least in principle, that this principle of self-determination ought to apply not just in Europe, but worldwide. Although he also believed that its implementation, especially outside of Europe, would be slow, would be gradual, would take time, and that's where he parted ways with uh, many colonial activists who heard his rhetoric and acted on it. So, by the war's end, as Jennifer reminded us, the president becomes a world famous symbol of the coming of a new world order uh, onto which various groups, both within Europe and outside of Europe, projected their fondest hopes and dreams. And it's interesting, even to this day in Prague you have various monuments and streets and avenues named after Wilson. At the same time, um, Viennese, Sigmund Freud is a great example, despised Wilson for having ruined their Austro-Hungarian empire and their beloved Vienna. 
he becomes a symbol. His words helped inspire and mobilize anti-colonial movements in regions from North Africa, stretching from North Africa to East Asia, including in Egypt, in India, in China, and in Korea, all of which exploded in protest, popular protest, in the spring of 1919. And if you're interested in more, more on that part of the story, uh, my book, The Wilsonian Moment, is, is basically a, a, a full-length treatment, uh, and I'm happy to talk about this in Q&A as much as you like. Now, Wilson's failure to make good on his perceived promise of self-determination led some anti-colonial activists, and I also talk about that in the book. These activists include the young Ho Chi Minh, they include the young Mao Zedong, they include the young Jawaharlal Nehru, all of whom are just beginning their political careers. Indeed, arguably, some of them, certainly is true for Ho Chi Minh and Mao, um, polit their political careers are, are significantly launched at that moment. Um, they all see Wilson as a disappointment, and they all, to one extent or another, look to Bolshevism after that for inspiration and support uh, to liberate their respective countries. So what I put before you is that despite his failures, and they were legion, Wilson made self-determination a central principle of international legitimacy, where it persisted and still persists today. It was then notably revived by Franklin Roosevelt or during World War II when he compelled, compelled the reluctant Churchill to include it in the Atlantic Charter. Roosevelt also took it further than Wilson had, particularly as it applied to territories outside Europe, to the colonial world. For Wilson, self-determination outside Europe was not beyond the pale, but it was a low priority. For Roosevelt, it was an urgent issue. And if we look at the anti-imperialist zeitgeist, in wartime, in, the, in, in wartime U.S., in wartime I'm now referring to the Second World War, uh, apparent, for example, in something like Wendell Wilkie's 1943 bestseller, uh, One World, we might think that self-determination would be central to U.S. post-war foreign policy. But here's the thing. To Wilson, support for self-determination in opposition to communist dictatorship had seemed entirely consistent. Remember that scheme. There were two central elements in an international order based on accountable governments, and he saw the Bolsheviks as, as proposing something the opposite of accountable government. Accountable governments cooperating through international organizations animated by liberal traditions. What he missed, we now know, is, is the tension, or a tension, one of the tensions, at the center of US advocacy of self-determination. And that's the tension. What if a nation, having gained its self-determination, determines to take a path that, it's, that is inimical, inimical to U.S. interests and values? How do you choose when the principle of self-determination clashes with other principles or interests that you hold dear? You being, in this case, the American policymaker. Already in the late 40s, we see Washington choosing containment over self-determination when it backed the French war in Indochina. And throughout the Cold War, the U.S. both supported self-determination of emerging nations on the one hand and undermined it in the name of containment on the other. Of course, the Soviets could be similarly hypocritical. After all, it was Lenin who first introduced the term self-determination into the wartime discourse in the First World War, and yet the Soviet Union, of course, um, invaded Hungary in 56 and then Czechoslovakia in 68 in contravention of that principle. So where does that leave us today? First, as I said, the 14 points were the origin point of the U.S. strategy of containment toward Russian communism. But it was more than that. As already mentioned, it was a founding document in the construction of a U.S.-led liberal international order, an order that, as solidified after 1945, has undergirded international relations for the better part of a century. Specifically on self-determination, it's an order based based, this international order, is based on the proliferation of self-determining states. We had 20-something states in the world in the, it, around the time of World War I, or around the time of the uh, peace conference. We now have s close to 200. That's self-determination at work. This led, on one hand, to more accountable governments, and on the other hand, 